Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is Tom Holland, author of two histories of the ancient world, Rubicon and Persian Fire. For his new book, Millennium, Tom has jumped forward in time to what used to be known as the Dark Ages. But as you'll hear, Tom sees the years around 1000 AD not as a period of darkness, but as the dawning of a new age. I asked him if the new book was in a sense a continuation of questions which had interested him in his previous two. I think so. I mean, I think that um, the longer you spend studying people from the classical past, the more you come to realise how actually very alien and remote they are from us. And I began to appreciate that the conventional tripartite division that we have of history into ancient, medieval and modern is actually false. And there's really only one great division in Western history, and that is the division that separates us from the world of classical antiquity. And that, of course, then begs the question of why did we have that split? And if we did have that split, then where does modernity begin? And the argument of millennium is really that modernity begins not with the Enlightenment, not with the Reformation, not with the Renaissance, but much further back at what we see conventionally as the absolute depths of the Dark Ages, but which I think is the moment where what becomes modern Western European civilization really learns to stand on its own two feet, becomes something separate and distinct from Rome, from the culture of Rome. The book opens with a very vivid scene in which an emperor and a pope have a meeting, and that, for you, is the caesura point between the the ancient world and the, the modern world. And you 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 argue that from that point, many things up to and including gay marriage in the twenty first century have some kind of lineage. Well, it's one of the the key classic moments in European history. It's the scene is Canossa, a castle in northern Italy. And the two protagonists are indeed, as you said, uh, Henry IV, who is king of Germany, emperor-elect, and therefore the heir of Charlemagne, of Constantine, of Augustus. He is a Caesar. And his adversary is a bishop, the Bishop of Rome, who's already known as the Pope, but who is laying claim to an authority that ultimately doesn't derive from the Roman example, but of course derives from, as he sees it, from heaven, from specifically from his right to hold the keys of heaven that he has received from St. Peter. What Gregory, the Pope, is arguing for is that the realm of the spiritual belongs to him and that the emperor should not have any hold on that. And there, in essence, you have what I think is the great fundamental theme of modern Western history, which is the division between church and state. Canossa certainly doesn't bring it about, but it serves the symbolic moment. And it's a moment of such drama, of such power, that I think it's a wonderful way to open a book. (laughs) I mean, rather like the crossing of the Rubicon, it it has a symbolic and dramatic value. And the Pope, by claiming something, I suppose, is also implicitly relinquishing something else. You know, that's what's interesting, of course, because the effect of it ultimately is that by leaving kings and emperors a dimension that is bled of the spiritual, ultimately what you have is a sense of government as being separate from from, from the control of God, which I think is why the drift of European history has always been away from theocracy, despite everything that um, the Pope may have aimed. But, you know, that's the fascination, of course, of history, is that revolutions and dramatic upheavals always have consequences that the protagonists can never imagine. And I think there's always a sort of the shadow of irony bred of posterity hanging over all these great events. You mentioned your feeling of dissatisfaction with the conventional periodization of history. Presumably, one of the motivations for writing this book was feeling that that no previous book had quite done justice to it in the way that you you felt it ought to be done. Well, it's a period that, that really isn't as well known as, for instance, the Roman Republic or the Persian Wars, both of which I did before. And I think the, the reason for that is that it doesn't lend itself to narrative, certainly in quite the same way. The point about Christendom at this point is that it is fragmented and shattered. And these fragments will ultimately go on to become what we now recognise as the various nation states of Europe. And those nation states have different historiographies, different ways of approaching the past. 
So to make sense of this whole period, you have to come to terms with all these different historiographies, and then you have to piece them together and trace themes that are common to all of them. One of the reasons why I chose the title Millennium and chose to focus on the sense of the year 1000 is that I think what does unite this period is a consciousness that the world may be ending. It is a period of utter horror and destruction. And yet out of that destruction, first of all, there is a conviction that the world will end. And that provokes not only fear, but hope, expectation. And when those hopes and when those fears are dashed, then the people of Christendom are left with a consciousness that since the New Jerusalem has not descended from the sky, then they're going to have to set about building it themselves. And I think that that is what then feeds into what we were talking about earlier, the theme of Canossa, where the Pope is consciously trying to build Jerusalem on earth. And I see this as really being the first great revolution in European history, mm. that attempt that the people of our continent make over and over again to sweep away the old, to build a new Jerusalem with who knows what consequences. You say that the history of this period is fragmentary and discontinuous, and I can certainly see your reason for saying that. Nonetheless, you get some very good narrative. You know, even if there is not a single overarching narrative, it seemed to me that, that you yourself have a strong narrative impulse, and there's some incredibly vivid writing when you pick up some of the stories that go to make up the, the bigger mosaic. I wondered, was that also part of the attraction of writing about this period? Absolutely. I mean, what I always like to do is to find areas of history where there is enough that people will know about to hook them, hopefully, but enough that it's completely unknown that it will surprise them. And so in this period, uh, it's the period of William the Conqueror, Battle of Hastings, which is, of course, one of the great narratives of English history. But each country has episodes that are just as exciting, just as gripping, and of course, just as well known to them, but we don't know about them. I think very few people would know the story of Otto the Great, who is the founding father of what becomes the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire and, and destroys really the last great barbarian invasion which is a, a completely thrilling story. There are spectacularly revolting, but gloriously exciting stories told about various Viking kings. There is the drama of the Islamic and Christian conflict in Spain. There is the drama of the, the recovery of the Byzantine Empire, which cut in this period, and then it's a total implosion. So there are endlessly thrilling stories to be told about this. And over and above that, there is this one single theme, which is the way in which people perceive themselves as part of a supernatural fabric. So over and above it all, you have this sense of cosmic drama. And that also I wanted to bring alive, hopefully to convey to you know, maybe the sceptical, agnostic, perhaps atheist reader, some of the passion and the hope and the yearning and the fear and the expectation that the peoples of this time had at the feeling that they were part of God's plan. And do you think that's the hardest thing for the modern reader to get their mind around? There are many things which are alien in the way that the people in this book behave, but perhaps that sense of God's plan and things ending and the signs and the portents being being everywhere visible that, that aspect is perhaps even more alien than the, the the brutality of of everyday life i think it can be i mean one of the one of the problems i found with writing it it made me realize how much harder it is to write about the middle ages than for instance classical antiquity is that lots of people will know plenty about christianity maybe christian themselves will know about whether it's the ethical teachings or the mythology of it Whereas to other people, it will be a totally closed book. And I think it's absolutely impossible to make sense of this period unless you really saturate it in Christian imagery and, and Christian thought. So that was a challenge. And that was another appeal of this millennial context, because I think even if you are, even if you're completely atheist, there is a, a drama and an excitement about the book of Revelation and its imagery that everyone is aware of.